Backpacks and bottles Shoes and sheets Clothing and containers Bedding and bow cases all these items and much more share a common skill to create them. A skill that uses materials that nowadays mainly goes to waste. It is a lineage of knowledge and a trade that is in danger of being lost forever. Hide tanning was an essential self-reliance skill for our ancestors, allowing them to use all the parts of the animal to create endless items to help them survive and thrive. Peter Annanen from Woodland Tannery is one of the last traditional tanners left in Scotland and over the past couple of years he's helped me create many of my historical items you've seen on my channel. In this video I visit him at his tannery and he talks me through the different techniques he uses to preserve hides using all natural non-toxic ingredients and gives examples of the variety of items you can make with the end material. Together we go step by step through an ingenious tanning method unique to Scotland known as peat bog tanning. As we go, we discuss what we can learn from the past, and I learn the many survival uses of the peat bog. So, stay tuned. Hi folks, Tom Fan Dabby Dozy, thanks for tuning in. I'm here with another video for the Highlander series, and I'm joined by Peter Annanen, who is a traditional tanner. Thanks so much for, for having me, Peter. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm gonna go over the basic principles of tanning and some of the um, materials that we're going to be producing. One of the first stages we'd be looking at is making rawhide. Um, so that's a so process of taking the hair off um, and the fat in the flesh. Um, and then that enables us to make materials like uh, making containers. So these were used in wells in Scotland as a way of bringing up water. Um, you can make coracles and all sorts of small kind of containers for storing food. You can also use the hide in Shetland or the windows traditionally up until 1950s were made oh. out of rawhide. And how, um, how transparent can you get so them? So pretty transparent, it's more kind of uh, like a foggy kind of glass. Yeah, yeah, they let like some yeah. light in but it's yeah. not like you can see exactly. into it. Exactly, um, but they'll be using the fish oil or the they sometimes mix uh, egg, egg white with a bit of honey and that makes it transparent okay. as well. So uh, interesting. So the next kind of process we'd be looking at is buckskin. Um, so some of you maybe know that from kind of across in America and Canada. Um, in Scotland we were producing buckskin for kind of riding trousers. So these are the kind of trousers they would have been making in Perth about 300 years ago. Um, made out of buckskin, uh, designed so that they kind of really grip onto the horse. Um, and they're very breathable as well, so uh, good for horse riding. Um, once they stopped making buckskin clothing, then they were more exploring into seal skin, which was developed in, in Dundee as one of the enterprises across there. Um, for that process, we're taking off the grain in the membrane uh, with a blade, and then we're uh, applying oils or brains. Okay. Um, and then that kind of moisturizes the hide, makes it nice and soft. And is it true the size of the brain of the animal can usually uh, cure the size of the yeah, hide? Yeah, kind give of, or yeah, give or yeah. take, yeah, okay, yeah, cool. yeah. Uh, then after we've moisturized the hide and got it nice and soft, then we're going to smoke it. Um, so that would be a way of uh, stopping the hide from going hard. Mm. If we didn't smoke it, the hide would basically go hard if it got wet. So go rigid, turn kind of like almost that back again. into yeah. rawhide, yeah. Okay. Um, and these kind of processes were discovered through people just living Trial in their houses error, yeah. and having a smoky fire and you put your hides up in the roof Stick and that just the roof, yeah. kind of preserved them. Um, the other process then, a slightly more complex process, is making bark tan. Uh, in this process we're extracting the tannins from the tree, um, so taking off the bark, normally in springtime when the, the sap is rising and the tree is trying okay. to produce as much tannins as possible to protect itself from insect attack or disease. Okay. Um, we then take the bark, oil it up and we make a solution bit like a big cup of tea really. Yeah, yeah. And then we put the hides in um, and the hide can be sitting anywhere between four months to a year okay, in the solution. So, long so it's a long, long process. So obviously in, in parts of the highlands there's very little trees, so yep. they use something else, right? What yeah, yeah so we'd use tormentil. Yeah. So that's okay. a small uh, plant, little yellow flowers, yellow flowers, and they would send the kids out up out into the that. highlands to kind of go and gather these tormentil uh, roots. Again, it just shows how much labor is involved because yeah. it's a really small plant. And what's great about learning the Gaelic names, it really shows you what they're, uh, what they're used for. So the Gaelic is Karshlar, 
which means bark of the earth. Yeah. So, you know, it's so, like a tree bark. Yeah. They've obviously figured that out, it's exactly. trial and error. Yep. Uh, so no, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so once we'd bark tan the hides, then we take uh, the fat or the tallow off the animal mm -hmm. and then rub it into the hide again to moisturize it and make it nice and soft, uh, okay. which is yeah important for yeah, kind yeah. of softer materials. But if you're making things like uh, water bottles um, or kind of shoes um, or kind of knife sheaths, then you don't really need to kind of fat tan nice them sheath. so much. Um, if you want straps on your bags, like this wee creel, uh, then you would want to soften it as well as if you're making things like sporins or kind of pouches on your on your clothing and things. Nice. Um, the other technique that we're going to go into is uh, bog tanning. Mm -hmm. So this is using the sphagnum moss. It basically creates an acidic environment uh, in the peat bog. Yep. Um, and we're going to be putting the hides in that um, okay. as a way of tanning the hides, uh, nice. which was practiced in Fife um, up until around the 1920s. Oh, okay. yep. Yeah, it's really interesting we were just talking about um, just how fragile these traditions are in uh, oral um, culture uh, which the highlands were especially the you know the Gallic culture um, really does it only really takes a generation of stopping these skills and they're they're gone no one wrote them down so I'd never heard of the peat bog method so um, it's really interesting I'm looking forward to learning it um, so yeah shall we get started yeah sounds good Let's do it So once the um, animal had been taken off the hill, they then take the hides and they would put them into a, a kind of lime solution or wood ash. Uh, this would uh, open up the hair follicles um, and the fibres and allow the hair to be pulled out. So these have been in lime for about two weeks. And then our next stage is that we're going to take them to the beam and then we'll scrape off the hair ready for the, the next part of the peat tanning process. Rid of excess lime before we take them back. Yeah. So, have you got a sheepskin here, Peter? So, yeah, right? this is a sheepskin. Um, it's been case skinned, so it's that's where the neck would originally be, and that's the legs coming off here and okay. here. Um, traditionally, these were used as floats. Um, so they would cork up the legs, like boy, then, boys, boys, yeah, fishing, fishing boys. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, they would inflate it, and then they'd cover it with uh, birch tar, oh, which would wow. make it uh, waterproof. Um, the other use in Scotland was to make bagpipes. Oh, okay. Um, so the cool. legs would be uh, either corked uh, with just a piece of wood and lashed round, or the drones would be coming out of the legs or yeah. out of the neck region. This is a slate tool. Uh, traditionally, a lot of tools were made in Scotland out of slate because it was easily accessible. Um, similar to kind of you'll see in ulus, which are rounded kind of blades um, for processing even uh, animals. Um, so it works really nicely because it doesn't uh, scratch into the grain, and we can just scrape along, and it just removes all the hair and wool really easily. Um, so it's a lovely tool to work with. So sort of imagining a Highlander in their sort of homestead, uh, how would they sort of set this up in terms of, uh, you know, liming the, the skins and yep. tanning them and things like that? Yeah, so they would have a, a big pit uh, either lined with uh, wood or stone um, in their yard and you'd be putting the hides in the lime um, and then uh, once you'd uh, dehaired them then you've got all this hair and lime mixture mm -hmm. um, which traditionally was used for masonry oh, so they would okay. take the hair and the lime and so then the hair is like the fibre that exactly binds it, it binds all together yeah so oh, nothing right. was wasted with these hides these are all ones that are kind of waste in a sense like, yeah they've come from the abattoir which normally the meat's kept but the hides are normally a waste and all this stuff would have just this just ended up in the tip exactly if you, yeah you didn't pick that up yep and get, getting these skills um learning the skills of our ancestors yeah. and just like it's actually way more respectful for the animal as well yeah. you're you're using everything everything exactly. yeah and the practicality as well of like you don't want to put basically these hides would normally go to incineration or landfill no. and they never get back into the nutrient cycle whereas if we're able to tan them then when people are finished with them they can actually put them back on the land okay so, so you um, could in theory once it's had his life put it in the compost yeah or rot down and get back into exactly, the system. Exactly. It's beautiful. <laughs> but if you use chemicals, 
which a lot of tanneries use, yeah. can't do that. Whereas okay. this process, it can go right back to the land to, to fertilise it. After our final clean up of the skins, we took a trip to the local peat bog. So you think this is a good spot? Yeah, this looks good. Yep. So uh, peat bogs cover a huge area of Scotland and Ireland. So this would have been on the doorstep for, mm -hmm. for lots of people living here. So this is sort of handy, handy place to yep. do this stuff. Exactly. Eh? Yep. Um, so peat bogs are great because they've got um, a lot of strong acids that the sphagnum moss is creating. Uh, so it's producing like gallianic acid and lactic acid. And it's trying to create an environment where other plants and stuff can't grow. Um, which makes it perfect for storing hides. Okay. Um, so it creates like a basic pickle jar um, where people would have been able to store hides um, or even meat. Yeah, um, so people so were storing food here. Exactly, right? yeah. So if they're killing a deer and you couldn't process it all at once, then you could put the deer in there, store it for up to three years, and it'd be years. preserved and still edible. Um, people stored uh, vegetables, fish. Butter. All sorts of butter. Um, so so butter wrapped in sort of yeah, leather. Yeah, butter wrapped in leather. They found ones in Shetland that's kind of hundreds of thousands of years old. Um, and that was one way they would pay the rent. Okay. Was you'd store your butter in the peat bog and then dig it up when you needed to pay your rent. What, um, what I really like about this concept in terms of survival is the, the idea of food caches. Yeah. Um, so that you could, uh, yeah, if you're hunting, if you couldn't carry all your food, yeah. you could bury it. but if you knew that you were going to location or you had almost like a bug out kind yeah, of exactly. situation yeah. if, uh, if, your, if your house was ever raided yeah, yeah. or attacked by a rival clan yeah, yeah. then you could have food yeah. uh, you know uh, and hides I suppose yeah, it's exactly. useful yeah. uh, stored in the bog. Yeah, yeah. Chuck them in. in. Yeah sounds yeah. good. <laughs> So traditionally shoemakers that were travelling around Scotland, what they would do is they would take the hides from the farm, mainly cow or deer, and then they would chuck them into the peat bog after they'd fleshed them, um, and then they would make their way around Scotland, and after six months you'd get back to the same spot, you'd take your hide out, uh, you would rub fat on it, uh, heat it up over a fire, and then make the shoes there and then, um, then you'd chuck your next hide in and make your way around. So, people really just travelled with basic tools so you weren't carrying your material which is a really ingenious way of kind of working a trade. Alright, you reckon that's enough? Yeah, that looks good. Sweet! So, Sweet. we'll see that in six months. Yep, so we'll head over to another spot um, okay. where I've got hides and they've been in for about six months so we'll uncover them and we'll okay. start working on them. Nice, yep. Sweet. let's go get them. So this is the hide that we've taken out of the peat bog. It's been in the peat bog for about six months. Um, we've let it dry out, we've washed it a little bit just to clean it up. Um, and now we're kind of opening up fibres and stretching it out. Uh, then the final stage is we're going to heat up some lard and we're going to take it over the fire and stretch it out and rub the lard into it. Drying it out, or so we're just getting it warm enough so that then the fat can really get in. absorb into the hide. So we're just sort of keeping that fat yeah. in sort of liquid form yeah. so it absorbs exactly. more into the skin. Yeah. It's kind of in a way osmosis when it's just damp enough and it pulls in the fat. If it's too dry it won't pull it in okay. and if it's too wet as well the water, water will just stop the fat from being pulled okay. in as well. So as we're stretching open the 
the fibers you can see the color change and that's as the density is changing from it being closed like a dark area to to lighter as it opens up so that's a good sign if you're getting it lighter that it's starting to become more open and softening softening the fibers um, if we weren't if we didn't oil it though or put fat on it then um, as you're opening it it could crack the grain So, after uh, quite a bit of time, we've got our finished bog turned hide. Yep. So it's been skinned yep. off the animal, it's been fleshed, it's been limed, limed. for two, two weeks, weeks yep. it's been dehaired, it's been buried in a bog for six months, yep. uh, washed. And then we've rubbed fat into it over the fire, um, and then it's been softened on a spike as well. So quite a bit of work. Yep, yeah. That is looking really nice. Yeah, it's actually. looking nice. Yeah, yeah. So, what's the sort of the properties of bog tanned compared yeah. to bark tanned and yeah. you know, other methods? So, the interesting thing that we've found out from experimenting with this material is that it doesn't wet form in the same way as kind of bark tan would. Okay. Um, so, bark tan when you get it wet, um, you can form it around objects and it kind of shrinks. So, like my my shoe video, if you guys seen that, um, that was bark tan. So. Yeah. It was good you can get the shape of your foot, yeah. but it contracts yeah. and expands every time exactly. it gets wet yeah. and things. So this doesn't do that. Whereas, yeah, the bog tan wouldn't do that. So for shoes, it would it would form it to a certain extent, but it wouldn't kind of get like shrink as much. Yeah. So it'd be ideal for shoes, um, for rain gear, where you want it to say um, to not expand pliable, and but things, yeah, yeah. To, but pliable, but that it doesn't shrink too much. Nice. Um, so it would be would have been excellent for yeah. Um, boots and kind of rain gear and things like that. It feels that like you can make a good pair of shoes out yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. I'd like yeah. to make a big poncho of it. Yeah. It'd be pretty heavy, but it'd yeah. be cool. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Cool. Well, that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no worries. It's been really fun. Yeah. Uh, we've we just we could make uh, hour long hours of videos yeah. of the amount of stuff that we discussed. <laughs> uh, really fascinating. All these things that you know we've talked about that are you know just lost or almost completely lost from the the cultural memory yeah. of scotland yeah. these sort of skills um so i think we could do lots of videos yeah. in the future Definitely. uh what we discussed bagpipes yep uh making a ski and do yep. from all bog yeah uh bog materials yep. uh rain gear fishing rain gear, gear fishing gear yeah so uh yeah. yeah look forward to doing more videos yeah. in the future Eight months after filming this video, we went back to visit Peter to pull up the skins that I buried in the bog so I can make my backpack. And I also bark tanned some cow stomachs while we were there to make some food pouches for my four day Highlander expedition. So go check out that video to see those items and my shoes in action. And let me know in the comments if you want to see some detailed videos on how those items are made. Shoes thanks to Peter for having me and sharing his knowledge check out his website for his products, services, and courses that he teaches. If you want to help support the channel, you can find ways of doing that in the links in the video description below. Cheers.